Sunbreak vs. Iceborne, or more broadly, Iceborne and World vs. Sunbreak and Rise. Both games are incredible, but which one is better? Is Rise a downgrade from the masterpiece that was World, or does it successfully build upon the formula that redefined the series four years ago? Let's find out. Monster Hunter World is one of the greatest video games ever made, and it's not just because of the brilliant graphical fidelity or the expertly crafted monsters and weapons you use to defeat them. What makes Monster Hunter World special is the entire experience as a whole. The environments, the aforementioned graphics, and the masterful combat all come together to create a one-of-a-kind experience that you can't find in any any other video game. World is so incredible because it took this formula, this idea of hunting monsters, and made it into a more immersive experience than it's ever been. Now the maps are fully fleshed out living, breathing ecosystems. There are dams that you can break to flood an entire area and send both you and the monster plummeting hundreds of feet. There are massive crystals on the ceiling that you can drop on monsters to stun them. The areas change throughout the hunts. Things break apart, floors collapse, the world is fully and truly alive. But, to add to this immersion is this feeling of scale. Monster Hunter has always been a series about fighting these terrifyingly large creatures dozens of times your size. I mean, just think about it. The starting monsters, the ones we often think of as a joke, are this big. For reference, that's about as big as a school bus. And I'd be remiss to make the claim that there's any Monster Hunter game that does a better job of demonstrating this difference in size and power than Monster Hunter World. The reason for this is because of what you, as a hunter, are both allowed and encouraged to do. As I mentioned before, there are these environmental hazards and traps that you can utilize to gain the upper hand, because against a monster the size of a house, you're gonna need every advantage you can get. There's this huge collection of rocks bound by some vines in the ancient forest, but something that large being held together by vines isn't exactly stable. Because of this, you can knock it down by just shooting some slinger ammo at it. You can even use the ghillie mantle to lure monsters right under it and then drop the pile of rocks on them. This is just brilliant as it perfectly demonstrates two things. First, your ingenuity. It just feels cool to lure a monster into a trap and get the jump on them by using your environment to your advantage. Second is again that sense of scale. You could imagine if this were a real life scenario, just one of these massive boulders would probably crush you into a fine paste. But for the monster, the entire pile just knocks them down for a bit. And it's not just this sense of scale. World does something else that really makes it feel alive. In the ancient forest, it's genuinely difficult to find a quiet spot that isn't buzzing with dozens of different creatures. There are even little details like this animation that your hunter has when idle in a hot area. It's these seemingly insignificant additions that breathe life into the world and help elevate the true best aspect that is unfortunately also the game's biggest weakness. But before that, let's talk about why Monster Hunter World is home to the best hunting experience of any Monster Hunter both pre and even post world. In Monster Hunter, you don't fight the monsters, you hunt them. While most games will put you in an arena for a boss fight, world asks you to actually hunt these monsters. You have to follow their footprints, find marks that they made, and eventually locate the monster themselves. This is what makes Monster Hunter World such a one-of-a-kind experience. These aren't bosses, you aren't a character in a game tasked with beating them. They're monsters, and you hunt them and no game better captures that idea than Monster Hunter World. But it isn't perfect. I mentioned this earlier, but the biggest flaw with World is actually the hunting part. Granted, it's incredible, but the scale can sometimes go from awe-inspiring to exhausting. The size of these maps are impressive, there's no doubt about that, and the idea of monsters randomly interrupting your hunts is extremely immersive, but it can also get a bit annoying. The biggest flaw with World is that sometimes I just want to fight a big monster, and World can prevent that from happening. Of course, there's also the Clutch Claw. If you've heard anything about Iceborne, surely you've heard at least a little bit of disdain for one of its biggest additions. Personally, I don't hate the Clutch Claw by any means. I think it's a neat idea that can add some cool combos to weapons. But its problem is that it often feels required to deal damage. Additions like the Clutch Claw shouldn't feel like a handicap. Hunting styles from generations are a great example of this idea executed properly. Adept style, for example, feels like a different way to play the game, but I don't feel like I'm missing out on something by using Guild instead. In generations, it felt like a choice. In Iceborne, Clutch Claw feels like a mandatory action that I'm forced to take to deal reasonable damage. 
The last thing I want to mention are the Guiding Lands. This, I feel, is the perfect endgame for Iceborne. It takes the ideas that the entire game was built around and expands them to their natural conclusion. It's a massive, wide-open area where you do nothing but hunt monsters. It's almost like one endless expedition. The endgame should mirror the rest of what you've done throughout the game and expand it in a meaningful way. And that's exactly what Iceborne's endgame does. But how does this all stack up to Sunbreak and Rise? Nothing is perfect, I even made an entire video on this idea. Despite how hard you try, something can always be improved. There are always small flaws here and there that can be fixed, or minor grievances that can be addressed. All in all, I really do believe it's impossible to make something perfect. But, you can get pretty close. And Monster Hunter Rise Sunbreak's combat gets very close. In fact, I go back and forth on whether or not this is the best combat system I've ever played. But that's a video for a different time. So, how did the devs at Capcom pull off such an incredible feat? Well, it all starts with how great combat systems are made. Any great combat system is divided into two parts. The allocation of those parts depends heavily on what the developer is going for. First, you've got the player. Look at something like Hyrule Warriors. Games like this are all about making the player feel powerful, and as a result, about 99% of the enemies don't put up a fight at all. This game is all about mastering your moveset and using that mastery to run through hordes of monsters. The second part is the opposition. Here you've got games that are the polar opposite of Hyrule Warriors, games like Ghosts and Goblins that deliberately cripple the player and force all the focus on the enemies and bosses instead. How a game's combat is designed will generally depend on the interactions between how the player is designed and how the opposition is designed. And while most games fall somewhere in between these two styles, I'm not sure I've ever seen a game balance both styles as well as Monster Hunter Rise. Since this is a situation of Monster Hunter vs Monster Hunter, I'll omit the whole 14 weapons thing, since both games have this. However, where Sunrise stands out are the customization options for these 14 weapons. Let's look at the greatest weapon ever created in any video game, the Switch Axe. See, Rise has switch skills that alter the gameplay a little bit. For example, you've got these two variations of the basic light attack. The first sees you scoop the axe up a bit. This attack is quick, not very committal, and just generally a safe low damage option. Your second option is this lumbering overhead swing. This attack is significantly slower on both startup and cooldown, but it also deals more damage, and even leads into a sword combo if you get an opening. Openings happen far more often with this attack too, since it deals so much damage. But it's very committal. It's a bit more of a risky move because of all the windup. Every single weapon in the game has 11 of these skills and attacks that you can switch in and out, so doing the math makes for 462 different combinations. Granted, the variation between each of these 462 options isn't as big as the variation between different weapons, but it does allow you to make a build that fits your exact playstyle perfectly. And as great as that is, Capcom wasn't satisfied with it. 462 options are cool, but Capcom took this a step further and allowed you to switch between sets, along with this dodge that's just absolutely ingenious. This ability to switch adds even more to the combat since now you can build two sets around two different playstyles. Maybe one is a safer set for when the monster is enraged with low risk skills. The second set on the other hand could be filled with high damage, high risk skills used when the monster is tired or down. Then of course there's the other half of the combat the bosses. Monsters in Sunbreak are designed around the player's ability to counter. They've got plenty of follow-up attacks and feints to catch players who are a little too counter-happy. Not only this, but they're designed to be fought aggressively. Look at the Three Lords, for example. Garen Golem has this form where you're encouraged to attack his hands to break him out of it and topple him. Luna Garen's ice armor can be broken with enough hits, and of course, Malzeno can be knocked out of his curio form. But nothing better represents this idea of aggression than anomaly monsters. As I mentioned before with the Guiding Lands, the endgame content should mirror the content in the rest of the game and bring it to its logical conclusion. And that's exactly what the anomaly monsters do. They reward precise aggression and punish patience. If you land enough hits on their glowing red spots, they'll take damage and eventually be knocked into a tired state, while if you don't deal enough damage in the allotted time, they'll explode dealing massive damage to you. Sunbreak is a game that asks you to master both your abilities and those of the monsters to a degree that no other Monster Hunter game has before. It's a game with a central focus on combat, and when that system is pushed to its most aggressive limits, you get one of, if not the best combat systems of all time. It's thanks to all of this that Sun- wait, hang on, there's a fly in here. Wait, 
That's not a fly. That's a- Wire bugs are probably the single most substantial- <laughs> Wire bugs are probably the single most substantial addition to Rise. They totally change how the game is played for better and worse. They add silk bind moves, which I think overall are excellent. Sure, some of them are a bit over the top, but overall I think they're a great addition. However, there is a slightly more subtle problem with them. Wire bugs almost break the game a bit. For example, most monsters don't have attacks like this. See how Narwa's attack goes across the ground and the only real way to dodge it is with a wire bug? Most attacks in the game aren't really designed like this. They're instead designed to hit hunters on the ground, which totally makes sense since that's where we are most of the time. The problem with this is it means you can avoid nearly every attack by just flying away. That said, as a whole, I love wire bugs, and while I'm not sure if they'll make a return for the next portable game, let alone the next mainline game, I'll enjoy using them while they're here. But there's another more fundamental problem with Rise if you could call it that. While World feels like a hunting experience, Rise feels more direct, almost like an arcade game. You jump into comparatively small maps, find the monster, beat it up with your super-powered hunter, and just move on to the next one. There's far less detail than in World, and as a result, the areas feel far less alive. But they're also much easier to traverse. So, with the positives and negatives sorted out, which game is better? Just to be totally clear, both of these games are exceptional. They're both one of a kind and they're two of the best experiences you can have in gaming. Plus, this is just my opinion at the end of the day. So which one is better? Well, if you ask me, Sunrise is better. No cop-out answer for once. That's just genuinely what I think. However, Worldborn might be the better video game. I think just looking at what it's done for the series, you can't understate the impact that it's had but I love the combat of Rise too much to say that I prefer World. With all of that said, there's a much more important lesson here. These games are trying to accomplish totally different goals. They're going for two different experiences. One is about the actual hunt, tracking down the monster, exploring the world, really just experiencing what it would be like to be a real hunter in this universe. While the other game is all about the actual encounters, just how skilled can you get? What combination will you use? What kind of combos can you pull off? Both of these games are at the top of their class when it comes to what they wish to accomplish, but if we're so busy fighting over which game is better, we'll fail to truly appreciate the greatness of both.